Hello, I'm Michael Small, co-host of the podcast, I Couldn't Throw It Out. We are so lucky to kick off our second season with a very special guest, John Flansberg of the band They Might Be Giants. I've been saving lots of stuff about them since 1985 when I reviewed the Giants' first demo tape in People magazine. So John agreed to help me throw it all out until we hit a problem. I like how your show about throwing things away is really just affirming that you're not going to get rid of anything. He did find a way to reduce my stash just a little bit. And you'll hear about it starting now. I couldn't throw it out. I had to scream and shout. Before I turn to dust, I've got to throw it out. Before I... Hello, John Flansberg. Hello, Michael Small. I want to welcome you, and I am so happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you, too. (laughs) I have, like, nothing but fond memories of all our exchanges in the mid-80s. And that reminds me that when I first heard your first demo tape, I was listening on a Walkman. Sure. and, And people were like, whoa, what's that? You know, what's that machine you're listening on? You are so young and advanced. Yeah. Well, you were, it sounds like you were kind of a, a like a hip hop kid. So you were rocking drum machines in every direction. <laughs> and well, all I was doing was appreciating other people doing it. Uh huh. In a, in a very timely fashion, it should be. <laughs> well, I want to get to how we first met. But first, I have to tell you what we need to do today. And I'm a little bit afraid of it because what we have to do is often quite painful to, for me. Usually, I'm joined by my co-host, Sally Libby, yeah. and she couldn't make it today, alas. So I'm begging you to stand into her role, Oh, okay. and you have to help with this wicked process, which is that this is a podcast where we try to get rid of the very special treasures I've saved for decades. So th- this is like, this is the, um, the art of Michael Small's death cleaning? Yeah, kind of. I'm ready to chip in. Let's go. Okay. Now there's one other thing I dread, (laughs) full of dread today and joy. (laughs) And that is that your presence in all of its inspiring beauty makes me think that I am ashamed of a few things that I did or said. And I would like to beg for your forgiveness during this hour and see if you will absolve me of these things. It was at the point where when you're... Sideband Monopuff put out a song called Backstabbing Liar. Mm-hmm. I thought it was about me. Oh, my goodness. Not really. I can, we can talk about who it was about. Well, that would be interesting at some point. Okay. Because this is so challenging, I want to delay for a minute, and I want to put the focus on you for a minute and on They Might Be Giants. Sure. Your band with John Linnell. Yeah. And I think you know what you have done, but I want to wallow in it. Okay. I have studied this a little, and I want to say it because I don't know if you'd be too modest. Well, I I don't think I've been accused of being too modest too much in my life. It might be a refreshing uh, change of pace. Here here we go. Now, it's been 38 years, I believe, since your first demo tape. Uh, I guess that's right. Yep, yep. And They Might Be Giants has released more than 40 albums. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm not trying to be modest here. If one just counts like regular studio albums. I think we actually have 19 proper albums. And then there's some compilations that are like B-side compilations, but, and then live stuff, EPs. Yeah, there's, we got a ton of albums. We got a ton of albums. If, if anyone doesn't understand this, I don't know what other bands release so many albums. I looked at Elvis Costello, and I think that you have about the same or more. And remember, he started his career seven years before you. Right. Why is he being so slow? Why is he working so slow? Let's get Elvis on the phone. This, I mean, this brings just, just this to me brings up an interesting topic, which is I don't think it's that important that people put out a lot of stuff. We, or I don't even know what the victory of it is. See, I told you you were modest. You just didn't know it. Um, we're re- revealing new things about you. There are, I believe, 450 songs of yours on Apple Music. Wow. 450. Uh, along with that, not just volume. You've written award-winning albums for kids about science, numbers, and the alphabet. Yeah. You won a Grammy for the theme song to the TV show Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah. You wrote a a song for SpongeBob, the musical on Broadway. 
You've been on Broadway. And got a Tony nomination for that. Whoa. Okay. I didn't have that on my list. I got to sit next to uh, T.I. at the uh, Tony's. Okay. There you go. That's just the songs that you've put on albums. You had a dial a song phone line with a new song every day for I don't know how long. How long did that go? Oh, forever. We were too scared to stop it at the point that it was of, of no of very little, very marginal cultural interest. And and a podcast where you also sang new songs. Uh, why did you stop the podcast? I think we were going out on tour for a really long time, and it was just too hard to keep up with. That tends to be the reason that things end in our lives is that the touring takes over. Also, you've been probably classified. I think people call you indie rock, but you've actually from the start recorded in an endless number of styles jazz country electronica i thought i heard a hip-hop song kind of well we work with drum machines a lot so like the hip-hop i mean in a way that our production has always been very informed by hip-hop production i mean john and i both landed back in new york city john's from new york originally but like we both ended up started in new york in the early 80s and uh the sound of drum machines was just everywhere and it was just the in most interesting kind of place to be culturally. So, yeah, I think as a as when we especially when we started, everything was informed by drum machines. So, yeah, there's a hip hop crossover. Now you play the guitar. What else? Are you- I program a lot of drums and program a lot of stuff. Uh, so it's like I'm doing a lot of digital music production. I've been done, John Linnell. Is it bass saxophone? Is that right? He plays a lot of saxophones and um, accordion and keyboards. And so he's like one of those guys who can like, you know, just jump up on the on the bandstand and start playing the drums really well. And it's like very intimidating. OK, so then I'm also blown away by your fascination with words and with the sounds of words. Some of the words I learned by listening to your songs include cloisonne, cephalophores, duende, right. apophenia. Wow. Like your, 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 your ability with language blows me away. But you're also a graphic designer. You contributed to the design of your many album covers. Mm-hmm. So you got, the, you got the music, you got the words, you got the visuals, you got the package. I mean, unbelievable. Michael, we, we got to have dinner with my mom sometimes so she can... I'm not done. Because you and your friends created extremely imaginative music videos. Yeah. And Rip Torn was in one of them. Yes, he was. He was. Okay. I would say one of my all-time favorite music videos. You, you may not, this may surprise you because it's not one of the most famous ones, is, is the video you did for the song Older. Oh, right. For uh, ABC. Oh, everyone who's listening to this should go to YouTube. They Might Be Giants, Older. Watch that. You will not regret it. Oh, interesting. Wow. You've been tracking us. Now, meanwhile, I haven't even gotten to your fans. I like to think of myself more as a friend than a fan because it, it, it soothes my ego. Mm-hmm. But you have a truly astounding and huge online wiki with details about every single word or note you ever wrote. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming fans contribute to that. It's all fan. Stuff. Oh, yeah. my, oh my god it's so helpful for us it's so hard to tr- keep track of how things have gone and it's very nice these people are geniuses some of them i i read it and i'm like whoa i missed the whole thing and yeah i think that all of this adds up to the fact that your career is unfreaking believable not just because you accomplished so much in one lifetime and in a single lifetime not more than one lifetime you only had one so far but that you and John Linnell never gave up on quality. I tried to prepare today by listening to every song on Apple Music. Oh, my God. It took me a while. There was one album I didn't like as much as the others, and I'm not even going to say what it was. (laughs) But there is no bad phase. Oh, interesting. What there are is inventive new directions, year after year, daring to try new things, to say new things, to have new insights. Do you aren't want to argue with that? You know, I I I want to uh I want to just bask in the glory that is this kind of praise because uh no, I mean the truth is we we started the band as an experiment and I think that is an ambitious thing to do. And um it has drained us. You know, it is it is it has been a a, a never-ending challenge to keep up with our own kind of abstract idea of what a band could be 
and um, it's just been a huge challenge. So like it's it feels nice to you know think that it's it's been fruitful. I'm very curious about this album you didn't like. Did you not like it because it was kind of harsh? Did it seem like sort of brittle or uh, did it seem like a, like drinking coffee grounds? No, 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 no. It just didn't. Because there's a couple, there's, a, there's one album of ours that I feel like is very bitter in sort of sonically and it's very edgy. It's very, it's just a hard on the ears. I'm willing to tell you which one it was, but it, although I've, any fans listening to this will probably stalk me and well no no but this didn't have those those catchy things for me in it and the album was nanobots oh interesting i'm sorry yeah there's got to be one one thing that doesn't connect in there or it wouldn't be real so anyway now it's real let's get to the present your 2021 album called book yes is not only one of the best of the albums you made and by the way two songs moonbeam rays and i broke my own rule everyone Go to Apple Music or wherever you go, Spotify, Moonbeam Rays. I broke my own rule. Listen to those. But it also comes with this 140-page book, which I've only seen pictures of, mm. with designer Paul Saar, photographer Brian Carlson. They illustrate your lyrics. It looks amazing. And it was nominated for a Grammy for Best Box Set. The Honorary Rhino Records Grammy. And now you had a sold out U.S. tour this summer, which included opening for Sparks at the Hollywood Bowl. And where are you touring this fall? Australia and across Ireland and across the UK. After summing all that up, my question is, is there a secret to how you keep at it and stay so productive? Like, how do you do it? Do you ever get exhausted? Oh, I'm exhausted almost all the time. I'm a, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit exhausted right now. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a good question. You know, I I have to say, like, I did go to art school. I mean, and I learned a lot in art school. And I, I really took a lot of what I learned there to heart in terms of about how to apply yourself and how to focus. I mean, I'm I, you know, I went to Pratt in the very early '80s. I remember that's when I knew you. Yeah, you would take these drawing classes that would be all day drawing classes. You know, and the second half of the class would be a two hour, two and a half hour, three hour drawing where you would just be working on one drawing for three hours. And for somebody who was raised on television and kind of raised in the sort of attention deficit culture that we all grew up in, it's almost like art school taught me that if you want to be struck by lightning, maybe you just have to sit on the hill, wait for the clouds to come, <laughs> and then the lightning starts, and then and then you'll get hit by lightning. You know, so so it's like it just makes you realize that it's not going to take forever. Like the clouds will come, the storm will start, the lighting will happen, and then you'll get hit by lightning. You just have to wait it out. And and like a lot of things just take time. Like the, you know, writing a song, this doesn't necessarily take forever. If you know how to do it, you can write a song. And you know, part of it is you know, you want to write songs that are good songs. So it's like you kind of have to work on that too. You know, I'm lucky that my musical partner and I are not like drug addicts or or like have like huge like you know, personality disorders that have kind of <laughs> taken us away from what we're doing. That leads into a few other questions. Do you have any tips for other people or anything to say about how you and John Linnell have worked together so many years and been able to keep the collaboration going? Uh, the, I think the part that's impossible to measure is that we had a shared history as friends. Like we had seen rock shows together as teenagers and all this stuff that like, might be more typical of people who are like brothers or sisters share. So we came at what we were doing with a shared aesthetic and also in some ways like a shared cultural sensibility. It might be hard to imagine the guys in They Might Be Giants as being like DIY punk rockers, but we saw a ton of small time bands in Boston play. And then with, you know, sort of interjected with a, a lot of small time bands out of CBGB that were coming on their first show shows outside of New York and all those bands would go on to become legendary new wave bands. But at the time, you know, you're just sitting at in the rat with like 40 people watching these bands going through that with John kind of informed a lot of things, a lot of the decisions we made later on. We, we bicker in the way that people bicker who've been around each other for a long time, but we don't really argue about big stuff because we tend to agree on all the big stuff which is nice. Going back to another thing you said, songwriting. I'm assuming there's a variety of ways you write songs, 
but do you tend to do lyrics before music, music before lyrics, or just 50-50? You know, this sort of circles back to what I was saying about the like experimental nature of, and maybe kind of, for me, the sort of art school-informed nature of our endeavor. Both John and I kind of come at things from as many different directions as we can possibly imagine. At times, we'll like solicit the other one for something lyrics or sounds or chord progressions or bass lines or drum beats or whatever just to kind of see what happens there isn't just a way to write a song ultimately is is that even in spite of all those experimental prompts or starts it ends up kind of being the same process because the end result is like what you want to write is like a durable interesting, hopefully memorable song. I'm assuming, once again, that the lyrics come from a lot of different sources. Is it accurate to say that sometimes the lyrics come from a word that interests you? Oh, sure. I mean, I did a song with John called Hate the Villanelle. The the lyric is in the form of a villanelle, which is a very odd, I guess, uh, don't go darkly into that strange, strange, what is it? Oh, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Yes, yes. Uh, that which is that Dylan Thomas? Uh, sounds like it. I'm looking it up. I'm fact checking myself. Yeah, Dylan Thomas. Uh, that's probably the most famous villanelle. But um, because the word villanelle is so extraordin- extraordinary in what it suggests, and the fact that it's an actual poetic form was just too hard to resist. And so I sort of set to writing a villanelle in that form. And it was, you know, there were times when it sort of felt a little bit like homework because it's a very, it's a fully structured set of syllables and a fully structured set of rhymes that you can't, you can't just go like, oh, this is the way I do it. You know, it's like writing a, it's like writing a sonnet or writing any kind of set form of poetry. You got to stick to the rules. There's no, there's no skipping out on the rules. But that was definitely like the genesis of it. Liking the sound of the word Villanelle. Oh, exactly. But then when I finished the actual poem, it was kind of more than I could handle. And then I just handed it off to John just because I was just like, you know, can you just do something with this? Because it's sort of overwhelming to me. And then like the first thing he'd ever seen was this completed verse in a very complicated form. And he's like, oh, this is this is really interesting. I'll, I can do this. Do dreams ever come into your lyrics? Not that uh, not that often. I think we talk about dreams more than we actually use the content of dreams. And is one of you really into sci-fi or both of you? I don't think either of us are really into sci-fi. Oh, that's weird. I feel like there's a sci-fi element in some of your songs. What about cats? One of you into cats? I have two cats that I love to bits. And John has two dogs that I think he has mixed feelings about. Beat up the cat if you need someone else on the mat. Oh, oh, that's jo- that's straight. That's straight up, John Linnell. I feel like, despite the fact that you are gregarious and open, that you are both somewhat private. I mean, you're protective of your privacy. At least that's what I picked up. Mm-hmm. But yet you're constantly in the public. Where you chose a career that's in the public. How do you make that work? Is that a struggle for you? Do you have rules that the two of you agreed on? Well, you know, in the beginning when. Rock music was very different than it. in a pre-rock video age. We were tr- talking about essentially being a faceless band. Like we don't, didn't put our our photographs on our records too much. And I think I think our, our initially we were thinking like maybe we would never put our pictures on the records. But then when rock video came along, it was like rock personas were a really important part of just branding or whatever identifying an act and kind of just having an identity as an act so I mean, we got sort of dragged into that but um you know we made the we made the best of that i i, I don't know I, like our, our biggest uh protective strategy is like we we kind of pretend we live in a world where they might be giants doesn't exist at all to me like i i have a very hard time thinking of of us having any place in the culture when people describe us, I, it doesn't seem like that's what we're doing. I don't, I'm always surprised when anybody knows who we are. Like, uh, <laughs> and then at a certain point, what's weird is that you kind of become like Burr Lives or something. Like, we're, you know, for a lot of people, we, you know, we've been around their entire lives. There's a whole generation of people who grew up with our 
children's music and then got into our adult music. And it's just like this background. Another thing that I love about They Might Be Giants is despite the fact that there's this sort of Ogden Nash kind of just the beautiful sound of words, all that stuff, there are some touching and very intimate songs that are about the challenges of relationships. The most famous one is Don't Let's Start. Mm -hmm. I've Got a Match, Unrelated Thing I Love. I'm just curious, did these songs just come out of the air or is there some, do you occasionally, either of you reveal personal things? Well, I mean, the the songs you're talking about are really like these early, there's a clutch of early songs uh, from the desk of John Linnell that really introduced a sort of a next level personal aspect to our discography and they're incredible songs i mean i think like even like the song she's an angel is like one of the is is such a beautiful song that john wrote years ago and it kind of opened the door to a kind of songwriting that i don't think i would have necessarily felt confident enough about and i've just been sort of drafting in off of his lead since then and you know hopefully held my own in that department what's interesting is when you get a songwriter like john you really get the impression like it's not his first impulse to share no so you feel like you're really kind of being let in on the inside of something uh you know a a fair bit more important and 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 intimate that's a wonderful way of putting it thank you i that's exactly what i felt and you validated me i feel wonderful now there's a lot of humor in your songs yeah. I'd laughed a lot. But the biggest belly laugh that I got was when I listened to the children's albums and you did a song that I think I heard a lot, which was a recorded a cover of a children's song called The Sun is a Mass of Incandescent Gas. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. And then I laughed like, I mean, really, like I could not stop laughing when I heard that you released a sequel to that song called Why Does the Sun Really Shine? Right. And can you talk, uh, you know, just a little bit about that scientific controversy? I I think the main takeaway from our whole experience with that is uh, that uh, science is is an endless, ever expanding inquiry. And uh, there's there's no there's really no end to it once you kind of open that door. Did you get people pushing back when you released the first song? When you do anything that's fact based, whether you mean to or not, you, you're sort of the de facto expert. And of course, when when other people know much more about something that you're talking about, it's really hard for them to listen to some phony expert say something that they clearly don't know very much about. In the case of Why Does the Sunshine, the lyrics it's a cover song from an educational record that was made for children in the early 60s by a folk artist and a professional songwriter. And um, if you were a progressive, you know, MIT dad or mom, you'd get these records for your kids. They made us an album of science songs. Why is the Sunshine is on that record. And we covered it essentially as a kind of a piece of camp early on in our career because we knew so many people would maybe recognize it. And they would certainly recognize the tone. You know, the baby boom stuff, they kind of invented that nutrition added children's entertainment idea. And the song is kind of tortured in that way that it keeps on, you know, it's a, it's a tuneful song, but it keeps on feeding you information whether you like it or not. And of course, the song is, the lyrics of the song are, are stolen directly from like the Golden Book Encyclopedia. Oh. Half the science in it is uh, is essentially out of date. So people would always be saying, well, you know, that, that song you're singing, you say those are the facts, but it's actually, that's, those are the facts from 1955, and we know a lot more about it now. I want to quote your, your lyrics, which you wrote. You wrote in your new song that made me laugh so hard. You wrote, forget that song. They got it wrong. That thesis has been rendered invalid. Yes. <laughs> that is a, a hard thing to... To put into a song. Yes. And it's a great song. We've got a healthy shoehorn to uh, shove those lyrics into a melody. But, you know, the truth is, it's like even that song is not quite right. I mean, there's 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 the, like the second verse of that song sort of skitters off and starts hitting the guardrails of, of legitimacy. So, Oh, you're destroying the minds of young children. Now, I, I want to make sure we get to throwing things up, but I want to say I'm glad you're alive and here. If you could just briefly tell us what happened to you a year ago. Uh, well, I mean, long story short, I got hit by, I was coming home from our very first show after COVID. We'd done this beautiful show. It was really 
extraordinarily life affirming playing at uh, the Bowery Ballroom in New York City. And, you know, the band was, everyone was there and the audience was all masked up and was feeling very safe and kind of like a, a beautiful time. And I'm driving home in like the slowest, most serene Uber of my life. The, guy, the driver's actually driving the speed limit in New York, which is 25 miles an hour. We came out of a blind intersection and, uh, and our car got T-boned by a drunk driver. I have no idea how fast his vehicle was going, but it was going fast enough to actually, it hit us. He T-boned us as we were coming through the intersection and flipped our minivan on its side and then pushed the minivan all the way across the street into the sidewalk. And me and the driver were just like, you know, tumbling around like uh, cucumbers in a s salad. And I broke all the ribs on one side of my body and uh, had like multiple fractured ribs. It's been explained to me that it was actually a much more serious accident than I realized. You know, like when it happened at first, I was, I was like, well, I'm okay. I'll just, you know, I'm a little sore, but I'll do the show in DC tomorrow. You know, I'll be fine. And like the doctor was like, yeah, I don't think you're really going to be going anywhere. <laughs> and uh, so I was in the hospital for a week and, and I was in bed for a couple of months. But, uh, you know, I'm alive. Are you okay now? I'm okay. You know, I'm like so many people who have accidents. The, part of the struggle is sort of living with pain. So that's one of those things that's just like a little bit more tedious than you wish it was and and you still have pain oh yeah 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 absolutely oh man every day it's a little bit a little less crummy uh. listen i'm very grateful to be alive it was a weird very weird interval in my life for sure you are kidding i appreciate your empathy i am very happy you're here and sorry you went through that and uh and now i'm sorry about what you're gonna have to go through now oh let's do it let's i'm looking forward to it okay so i can't delay any longer the idea is that if we tell the stories behind these things, that maybe the, the objects can be passed on. Of course. And I don't have to cling to them. Yep. Here is a treasure. Now you see its frame. Oh, my goodness. There you go. Beautiful. My wife, Cindy, who is a wonderful artist, got me a They Might Be Giants calendar in 2017. Uh-huh. And we were writing it at things like... Uh, book group at Janney's, <laughs> things like that. And then we came to June 30th. Mm -hmm. And this is what we saw written permanently on every single calendar for that date. It said, the 1985 demo tape is reviewed in People Magazine by Michael Small. The review is often cited as the band's first large-scale exposure, earning them the attention they needed to secure a record deal with Bar None. Right. You put this on the calendar, or somebody did. That was so incredibly nice. And this is our treasure. Cindy added sparkles and stars and fireworks around that date. We hang it on our wall. And don't even start in with me. We're not throwing it out. So go away about that one. I would never throw that out if I were you. While we're at it, Cindy was doing some book art, and she made this book. And it turns out that it's a Kurt Vonnegut book. And she inserted a little wooden bird in a wooden birdhouse on the cover. And it says, little birdhouse in your soul. Oh, that's beautiful. So it was inspired by the They Might Be Giants song with that title. And then she illustrated the inside, writing over the text, painting over the text. And it's a sort of journal of our lives, often with birds, because... It's the birdhouse in our soul. And this also hangs on the wall. And, you know, no way. No way is that going to be thrown away ever. I like how your show about throwing things away is really just affirming that you're not going to get rid of anything. <laughs> you figured out my secret. Yes. yes. Well, if it, if, it, if it brings you joy, I think that's... Okay, I'll put this on for a second. This I'm also not throwing away. This is a uh, They Might Be Giants hat, green yellow striped with a pom-pom and um it says person man on it cindy gave me this for a birthday you're killing me man it's beautiful it's been used a little over much uh, uh, it's a little bit needs washing but i don't want to wash it because it's my treasure and i was walking through the suburbs and i walked past a, a girl who looked like she was about 12 uh -huh. and she said like your hat 
And I said, it's from the band They Might Be Giants. You need to go online and watch. And she looked at me like, you old man, go away. You seem a little crazy, sir. Well, you know, um, first of all, that hat is synthetic. So there's absolutely no problem. Just it's like oh. put it in the, put it in the sink, put a little woolite or a little, even a little dish soap in warm water. You can wash that out; it'll be dry in 15 minutes. Mm. But you know about the Kurt Vonnegut? My my high school friend Jimmy Mack, he lived in his parents' attic. And when you were talking about book like book art, making art with books in his attic, you know had, he had some of his father's his father's stuff. And including this collage, it was probably the size of a paperback in, or just a little bit bigger than a paperback. And it was a piece of collage art that was the actual art, not a reproduction of the collage that somebody had put together. And we didn't really know what it was. And then we figured out it was a friend of Jimmy's dad who had worked for a New York publisher as an illustrator. And he had done the covers to all of the Kurt Vonnegut books and this this piece of artwork actually was the cover of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. So when you pulled out a Kurt Vonnegut book, I was like, now I have like two connections to Kurt Vonnegut. And that, that was somewhat coincidental. Cindy picked Kurt Vonnegut because she liked the look of the binding. Oh. Anyway, this is where we get into the semi-weird. Do you see this tape? Oh, yeah. I recognize that stamp. Yeah. This is the demo tape tape that I reviewed in People Magazine in 1985. This is... Oh, excellent. The tape. This is the way I save things. Oh, yeah. Over here, this is the actual review that I wrote in 1985, which I saved. Right. I don't want your head to get too big. I've saved every review I ever wrote. Does that have a photograph of us on the other side? Is there a photo? Oh, is it just a straight review? Uh, yes. But there you are. There's the yep, photo. Yep, 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 yep. What is the date on that? 1985. It was June. I'm trying to think. Of, I, I had a really great job right out of college doing pay stuff at Macmillan and in publishing. And then it, one of the articles in People, I'm not sure if it was the first one or the second one. Yeah. I had basically gotten let go from my first really good job. And then like a lot of people, you know, when you lose a good job, you're kind of scrambling around. And I worked for Scholastic, which was terrible, literally, literally working in a closet, worked for Simon Schuster, which was OK. And then I ended up working at Random House. And that was like the all time nadir of my experience. <laughs> but, you know, I was just a freelancer. So like freelancing back then was kind of a tough thing. But I had I had a boss. She was very cruel. She was very like a very cruel boss. From the jump, she was really mad at me. I told her I had a night job, which I don't think she believed at all. But in fact, we, you know, they might be chance was playing all the time and we were rehearsing every night. So I didn't want to be called on to do overnight, last minute deadline things for Random House as a freelancer and not be able to do gigs or like have them interfere with my ability to do gigs. So I said, like, I can only work days. It didn't seem like so, so unreasonable. And when one of your reviews came out i came to my desk at random house at 10 a.m and on my desk was an open copy of the people magazine with the, the photograph of me like facing up and i was just like what's you know what's this you know and it was just on the newsstand that week and then like my boss comes in and she's like john we have to talk i basically lost my job she was so furious because of me. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. She was like, you lied to me. And I was like, I didn't lie to you. You know, it's like, you said you had a second job. It's like, I do. You know, and what's funny is that this is like, this is very much at the very end of my freelancing life. Like I'm, I only had one job really after that. So I, and then I, and then I became like a full-time professional musician in a band that would become like my life's work. It's not like when I said, like, I had a second job, I wasn't really lying. Like, I actually, I knew that there would be a penalty if I said I was in a rock band. I was definitely in the straight world. I couldn't just be upfront about it. Wow. But she was, she was not having it. I ruined your... Well, you know, like, one, one, door, one door closes, another one opens, Michael. I guess so. Did you ever, when you were younger, think, I'm going to be a musician, that'll be my career? No, no. I, I, I thought maybe I'd be a DJ. Well, you could DJ your own music endlessly. So 
Do you think there's any fan groups who might want these? I think you could get $100 in one hour putting that on eBay. I don't want $100. I want it to go to somebody who, I mean, I, of course, I want it. You want to send me $100, I'll take it. But I want it to go, like, is there anybody who would preserve it? The wiki people? I'm sure the wiki people have other, they have seem to have other copies of it, but I would love to, um, I would love, love, love to take a photograph of that before you get rid of it. Can I send it to you? Would you take it? Please, send it, absolutely. Okay, that's the best. I'll do everything I can with it. Okay, I'll be sending you that. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get your address later. Yeah, yeah. Send it FedEx. Yeah, I also have this um, cassette where you wrote to me, to Michael, thanks for the start in show business. You are rocking, John Flansburg. And this is a copy of Advanced Cassette of John Henry. Oh, sweet. I can't throw it. I don't know. I, I don't think this can go to anybody else. Personal messages from me, those, those can't be thrown away. <laughs> I'm, be, I'm being cremated, so this this will go with me. Okay, so I, look, I'm sending one thing to you. That's That's progress. Do you have a storage space, Michael? We have an attic now. But, you know, someone's going to come in and throw it all out. I don't, I don't, I can't take that. Now, here we got to an apology. Okay, we're at apology level where you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal the secret sauce behind uh, record reviewing. Oh. It was on my third They Might Be Giants review, and the editor said to me, we are not in the business of being a publicity firm for They Might Be Giants. Either write a review or you say what's good and bad or stop. Oh, wow. Tough love. But I was such an amateur. I didn't have confidence or, or knowledge about what a reviewer should do. So I put in something mean because I was told to. That's great. Let it rip. What, 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 let it rip. Okay, here, here's what I wrote. Not as funny as they think they are. Flansburg's vocals can slip into a slightly grating stray cat mode. And here's the thing. Here's the worst part of it. I could not really tell your voices apart. Even though your voices are different, there's a quality where there's a similarity. Mm -hmm. And I am not sure that I was referring to you. I think I might have been referring to John Linnell. I'm trying to think of the stray cat part. Oh, no, no, no. I, I get it. I get it. Will you accept my apology? I'm just trying to process all this. Of course I'll accept your apology. You don't need to apologize. There's nothing to apologize for. But that was terrible to put it in because an editor... That's, that's, that, that's not true. There's not, you know, if you're writing critically, you should just like let it rip. You let it rip. I think it's good to be... Just be as mean... Everybody, everybody loves it when people are real. But I wasn't being, it's, it's so amateurish to put it in because an editor. It's weird that it was imposed by the editor, but you know, they just wanted to keep you, uh, keep you going. And I selected you when anyway, next we have this review I wrote for Mademoiselle. Uh huh. They called you goofballs. I did not use the word goofballs. Right. And they put the word silly in front of synthesizers. I did not put the word silly in there. After that. I called Glenn Morrow. Do you remember him? Sure, of course. And I said, how do I get in touch with John Flansburg? He told me the only way to find you was to fax you. Uh -huh. I don't know if you received this fax, but in case you didn't, I want to say this to you now. Ostensibly, the fax was meant to tell you how much we enjoyed your San Francisco concert. But at the end, I get to the real purpose. This is what I wrote. I hope you didn't see my Mademoiselle review of your new record. I was between editors, and the in-between editor cut some details and added some adjectives that I don't want to claim. And furthermore, my dog ate it. <laughs> Michael, it's all good. It's all good. Oh, this is such a relief. Uh, you should throw that fax away. What does that say, Michael? It's, it's a note from John Flansburg. Uh-huh. And it's beautifully written by, like, a graphic artist. Uh-huh. And it's got a nice signature. It says, how are you? I hope this actually gets to you. We are doing great. Hope to see you this fall. John F. Well, that's, that's super nice. Clear, clearly, the silly synthesizer thing did not stick. Okay, so this, this and the cassette will go into the cremation with me. Okay. Now, here's an invitation to Monopuff Syndicate, Thursday, February 5th. It says, hello, Michael. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do the wiki people want this? Probably. Oh, look at that. And with opening with, with Double Dong, that was an extraordinary act, Double Dong. See, like, you've collected, like, sweet things. Like, those are, like, all the very tasty. I mean, like, some of them are personal, but also, like, just, like, 
Do you ha- is your attic filled? Are you a hoarder? Is it a crisis? No, it's curated, greatly curated. There's someone I live with who happens to be my beloved wife. We act like I'm the person who collects the most. And I can't believe I'm saying this on the podcast, but I believe that her art supplies take up more space than what I've saved. Right. And Cindy, I didn't really say that. (laughs) One reason why I hate to give these things up is that you went out, you created all these songs with John Linnell. You created all this beauty, this fascinating, mind-bending stuff. And my big claim to fame is that I spotted you first. But it was a very, very, you know, just speaking as somebody who was there, like, I got to say, like, it was a life-changing, career-altering kind of recognition, in part because you were, had a very clear I, I, idea of what we were doing and framed us in a very smart way with what you said about us, but also that you were working for such a high-visibility national magazine ended up being, it was like lashing like a Saturn V rocket onto the back of a very small and stoppable force one of the things I wrote in that review was this pop rock duo is bound for greater glory, which was correct. And the worst thing, though, is that I had to, you know, I was really into puns. At the end of Elvis Costello's King of America, I said, he may not be the King of America, but he's the most honored knight of our round turntable. Uh. (laughs) I was into those things. But with the end of yours, I put, these guys should definitely change their name. It won't be long before they really are giants. Well, th- th- that's another first. Amateur. Uh, well, people have been playing on the name forever, so it just comes with the territory. So now I've got more apologies. Do you have five more minutes? <laughs> yes, absolutely. In 1996, you came to San Francisco. I interviewed you for Hot Wired, the website for Wired Magazine. Right, right. It was really cool. Websites were new then. We had an online audio interview. I have the tape, of course. You're not surprised. And I might put it up where people can hear it because you were really good. But at the time, this was a startup, crazy internet environment. Right. I've got to see if you remember this. We did a good interview, and then I was driving you somewhere afterwards, and I broke into this huge rant about, I can't do my editorial things I want to do, and it's all about money, and they're not thinking about this. There's people don't know what they're doing, and I ranted like crazy. And you, I could see you recoil like, ooh, you know, okay, just, yeah. (laughs) And afterwards, I thought, oh, my God, I'm such an idiot. This guy is going to go on stage now. He does not need to hear my rant. And so I want to say, I'm sorry if I scared you. I'm sorry that I get so wound up about stupid things. I never should have cared. Were we driving over like the, the bridge in San Francisco or something? I don't know. We were, I was driving you to the concert or something. I don't know. Uh-huh. We then went to the concert and to top it off, you were so freaking generous in front of all those people, including people I knew from work. You said we dedicate not just this concert, but our career to Michael Small. Well, there you go. After I was such an asshole. Oh, you, that's not being an asshole. Complaining about somebody, you know, it's not some being an asshole. Like, people got to vent. Wow. Wow, that's generous. That is it's not generous. That ger- it's not that generous. We're all just human beings, you know? Just doing what we can. I've been walking around with this weight. <laughs> okay, so I, I have one last apology for you. <laughs> It's going to be okay. <laughs> How good I made you laugh. Yes. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I've been laughing the whole time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My biggest apology of all. This is a bad thing. I was getting into the internet. I did the internet for 27 years. Uh-huh. And by the way, when I left NBC News was my last job. They did a Michael Small exam. And they said, what is his favorite band? And they all guessed they might be Giants. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's beautiful. I know it was beautiful. And they're wonder- wonderful people that I worked with there. I miss them so much, but I'm glad I'm retired. So anyway, I was so wrapped up in all that that I stopped listening. I thought that They Might Be Giants was making kids music. Oh, sure. And until I prepared for this interview, I stopped listening. And and I want to say that, as I said, I tried to listen to all 450 songs. I might have missed a few <laughs> every night when I did the dishes and when I was driving, whenever. But I've got to bring up to people, if you stopped listening to They Might Be Giants with the album Flood, you must listen to this playlist I put together that I'm putting on our website at throwitoutpodcast.com. I want to tell you the song, The Captain was one of my favorites, The Mesopotamians, Madam, I Challenge You to a Duel. Love that title. Nice. Let me tell you about my operation, which sounds like Bobby Darren. Yeah, yeah. Wicked Little Critta, which nobody gets Boston accents right, and you guys did. It's the best Boston accent. I played it for my whole family. 
And in Nine Secret Steps, you even have lyrics about throwing things out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, both John and I are big uh, thrower outers Whoa. in our families. We run a clean ship. Well, let me just quote what you wrote. You wrote, throw away the thing that tells you not to throw the thing away. You'll forget to rue the day you went ahead and threw the thing away. Yep. Love it. I just really feel like you've done wonderful work. So I hope you'll accept my apology. I, I didn't listen for years. This show is, should be Michael Small apologizes. It's like <laughs> this has been more of a, a therapeutic uh, apology session than throwing things out. <laughs> and so I just want to say thank you so much, John Flansburg, for being with us. Everyone, you can find... Uh, that wonderful playlist of They Might Be Giant songs on the page for this episode at throwitoutpodcast.com. Please follow the podcast, if you will, on Instagram and Twitter at throwitoutpod. And if you go to Apple Podcasts and give us a positive review. Five star, five star review. You will also be giving a positive review to John Flansburg. Yeah. Please. We'd really appreciate that. And Sally will be back for the next episode. She is so sad. She missed talking to John. However, she wants you to know her brother-in-law worked with your father, who's an architect, right? Oh, really? Yeah. And he said your father's a wonderful architect and an inspiring person. Oh, fantastic. So your generosity and taking time off from your tour to talk to me and all of us is so greatly appreciated. Of course. And now we get to listen to our theme song performed by Boots Camp, Jen Ayers, and Don Ralph, who is the leader of another great indie band, Life in a Blender. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Michael, always a pleasure. It was really fun. See you soon, Mike. Bye-bye. Look up that stairway to my big attic. Am I a hoarder or am I a fanatic? Decades of stories, memory stacked. There is a redolence of some irrelevant fact. scream and shout It all seems so unjust But still I know I must Before I turn to dust I've got to throw it out Before I turn to dust I've got to throw it out Well I couldn't throw it out Oh I couldn't throw it possessions in these painful sessions i guess this is what it's about the poems cards and papers the moldy musty vapors 